and it's uh, here uh, this day saints this uh, is our Wednesday Bible study August the 29th and uh, our topic uh, that we will be discussing for this evening is part of our study on the kings of Israel and Judah this is a new uh, lesson and we're dealing with one nation with one king one nation with one king and David in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 4 uh, has shown the uh, hope of Israel that one day in the world of Christianity this is a uh, metaphor uh, that that would be one nation and that would be one king and it would be the sheep that are of God's uh, fold that he would give to Jesus and it would be the sheep that Jesus was going to go out also and gather from the Gentiles and make one nation and he would be the one king over it. So that's why Jesus is referred to as the spiritual David in Ezekiel because that was his plan because Israel is going to get divided uh, through sin after David uh, has his rule and uh, eventually they're going to erode after Solomon uh, becomes uh, an individual who gets beside himself and decides that he is smarter than God and he can handle it like a lot of us do in life and he didn't handle it and so the kingdom was torn and trouble lasted until Jesus himself came. So the first second Samuel chapter 4 says and when Saul's son heard that Abner was dead in Hebron his hands were feeble and all the Israelites were troubled. And Saul's son had two men that were captains of bands. The name of the one was Baana, and the name of the other, Rechab, the sons of Rimon, a Beorothite of the children of Benjamin. For the Beoroth also was reckoned to Benjamin. So what you have is a situation uh, where the uh, individuals who are of Benjamin, you have uh, the Beorot, who are kind of much like they are linked to uh, Judah. You don't hear a lot about Benjamin, but they've always existed after the great battle that the other tribes had against them for their homosexual practices in their particular uh, land. Uh, they knocked them down such in battle that they had to stop. One of the leaders said, stop, let's not kill all the Benjamites. Remember first hearing that lesson in great detail taught by Brother Anthony Carr uh, one great day, one Sunday. And so, uh, we understand the Beorah, they are also uh, counted, reckoned, or put in the inventory uh, with the Benjamites. So verse 3 of Second Samuel chapter 4, verse 3, and the Beorothites fled to Gittim and were sojourners there until this day. And Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame of his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it came to pass as she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. And so what you have a situation now is this kid was about five. Nurse was picking him up. Uh, they heard about Saul and Jonathan uh, being, you know, in duress and about to be slain or already slain. She ran. The child must have fallen. Some type of way the injury was so severe uh, that uh, his feet, he could not use them anymore. So let's look at verse 5. The sons of Rimon. The Beorothite, Recap, and Baana went and came about the heat of the day to the house of Ishbosheth, who lay on a bed at noon. And so now what you have is remember Abner's dead. Uh, there's still bad blood between the house of Saul and David. Ishbosheth knows his time is limited before. It's over. Uh, and now you've got these particular individuals here uh, who have uh, teamed up 
and they are going to take care of Ishbosheth uh, while he's sleeping on his bed at noon. Verse 6, and they came thither into the midst of the house as though they would have fetched wheat. And they smote him under the fifth rib, and Rechab and Baana, his brother, escaped. For when they came into the house, he lay on his bed in his bedchamber. And they smote him, and slew him, and beheaded him, and took his head, and got them away through the plain all night. So they, 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 they killed the guy in his own house, in his own bed, cut his head off. Uh, you can imagine people finding the body, the trauma of that. And they, they, they make haste all through the night, all through the night. They've got a mission and a plan. You know, a lot of times we will do things in life where we will see, as we talked about last uh, time when we were dealing with this subject, uh, we mentioned that when you fight a saint, you'd better bring your A game. Because if he has any crookedness at all, he could whoop you. He could embarrass you, expose you of not knowing some particular part of your very own lesson. So what happened is is when we're engaged in a lesson we have got to understand that no one knows everything. I've been before you all and before others and was did not know an answer to something and also uh, had answers finagled from me. Nevertheless uh, I learned from that that You've got to know your lesson and be prepared for questions. How is that one done? When you trust God and you've done your best to study and you're right in your point. So you need all three of those. If, you, if you're right and you have, have done your best to study and you don't trust God, you're still going to lose. You're going to be embarrassed and there's going to be drama and trauma in your life. And so... When you are attacking a saint, you've got a certain pattern and a way you've got to do it. You can't just treat the saint as if they are a gag. You can't treat the saint as if they are Baptist because you're actually trying to rescue the soul. But in this case, these fellows don't understand this isn't the way you handle this. And so... They've traveled all night, verse 8, 2 Samuel 4 and 8. And they brought the head of Ishbosheth unto David to Hebron. And said to the king, Behold the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, thine enemy, which sought thy life. And the Lord had avenged my lord the king this day of Saul. And let me see. So remember, they're trying to bring peace, bring two nations together. So they said, well, We bring his head to David. You know, it ought to be cool with us. We ought to have us. You know, a lot of love from David when he takes over because then that was going to happen. Right now, David has about a six to seven year reign that is going to be accumulated solely in the area that has received him. But in actuality, there are those of Jerusalem that don't really like David. And he's going to make that his city. See, we kind of think when we talk about the last time David is crowned king, but we were strict on saying Judah, but not everywhere in Judah. And see, you know, when we look at later, when we study, we see that Israel is pretty well packed together, even with raggedy kings. But that was a time when Israel had to be put together. And one thing you and I have got to understand, the Lord has to put each congregation together. And that's going to be a time you're going to have crooked leaders, and you're going to have weak members, and then a combination of both being righteous and maybe the other one being bad. And so that's how it's going to get put together. And it can always fall apart at any time. And so we see in uh, verse 9 says, And David answered Rechab and Baana, his brother, the sons of Rimon, the Beerothite, and said unto them, As the Lord liveth, who had redeemed my soul out of all adversity. And you got to understand, you see the Bible mentions again, there's an important understanding in this lesson that God is getting through. The, these are Saul's boys. And they have killed Saul's son. Who Abner encouraged and made king. And David has not killed Abner, but Joab has. And Abner was basically those ten tribes' only hope of 
being able to sustain themselves against David. And so what ends up happening is now these guys think we've done an excellent thing in what we've done. So in 2 Samuel 4 and 10 it says, uh, When one told me, saying, Behold, Saul is dead, thinking to have brought good tidings, I took hold of him and slew him in Ziklag, who thought that I would have given him a reward for his tidings. I want to share something with you. David never put a finger on that guy. But he told one of the other men to fall on him. Notice how the understanding must be accepted. The Lord God Almighty gives the commandment. David gave the commandment. So therefore David takes credit for having him slain. Because without David's command they wouldn't have touched him. That's why Joab's murder of Abner was going to go against him forever. Because the fact is David did not give a command to carry out this particular act. So it became a murder. David said, my hands are free of his blood. We're trying to work out a deal together. And he said that the law will pay him back. He said, I can't do a whole lot about it. Now you might wonder, you say, well, why would David say that? You know, why wouldn't David just handle Joab? Several reasons. Uh, he took care of a guy that was great and David called him great but David knew he was weak because he let David slide in the camp you never should let somebody slide in the camp and almost kill your master so David called him out that day as we started before Abner did a lousy job you should die but he was willing to work out a deal so it wasn't like his heart was just oh Abner, Abner which he said those things because he was hoping there'd be a league and everything, but he knew Abner wasn't really, really that good. But the key is, is that still he puts it in the law's hand. But we have to understand is that David is the king, but he says why? He says the sons of Zeruel they are too heavy for me now, and he says I am weak. So that's not to David's credit, but the law took over. And sometimes in our lives, when we are weak. And something is too heavy for us. The Lord may intervene and take care of it for us. But don't keep running to the well. Because one day the water may be gone. At some point David has to rise up and take care of business. And he knows this guy's going to be tough on Solomon. So he said, you got to handle it before he die. And he's going to handle Shimei too. Solomon is that is. And so therefore go back to uh, verse number 11. 2 Samuel 4 11. He says, how much more when wicked men have slain a righteous person in his own house upon his bed. David said, you see now, Ishbosheth is righteous and that why? He is a saint. He is separated from the world. He is Saul's son. But he should not be king, but that doesn't make him just 100% bad because in his mind he's been told and pumped up in his head by his dad all the time, you the next guy, you the next guy. Your crazy brother Jonathan don't want one of y'all got to take it over. So Jonathan dies in, Ishbosheth gets it, but David still acknowledges he's a righteous guy. He wasn't an idolater, you know, and he just can't be king. So it says, when you go into somebody's house and kill them on their own bed while they're asleep and he's righteous, it's like, man, what's with you guys? So he says, shall I not therefore now require his blood of your hand and take you away from the earth? And David, now see, he's called the commandment, but he's not going to touch this guy either. And David commanded his young men, and they slew them and cut off their hands Watch this, and their feet and hang them up over the pool in Hebron. Can you imagine the pool? You know, you, know, you cut your hands and feet off, man. You bleed, and you don't keep bleeding to that body. Because you're hanging like that, that body's going to run dry off, yeah. off the blood. That pool going to come out. Man, what's all that blood in the water? My goodness, look up. God's hands all cut off. He's sending a message out that don't kill the righteous when they're in a position of vulnerability. Don't do that. And so he says, uh, but they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried it in a sepulcher of Abner in Hebron. So now you've got a lot of drama. And this happens in the church. A lot of drama. People attacking one leader. People attacking this leader. He shouldn't be a leader. And, and, and you have this going on, but at some point, order must be set, saints. It has to be set. And it has to be set according to God's word. So if, here's the key. Praise God for the lesson. If you sit down a leader for the wrong reason, brethren, let me tell you something. It's not going to go well with you. God going to cut some hands off and some feet spiritually. Where's the message? You won't be able to grab what you want. 
You be wanting to grab safety from alcoholism, drugs, womanizing, gold digger, whatever, thievery, but you won't be able to get out. The hand will be there, the Lord will be saying, reach up, grab me. You don't have no hand. And your feet, you won't be able to walk. You know what I'm saying, man, with no feet? I'm talking about feet cut off. How are you going to walk with no feet? You might balance yourself at some point, but it's going to be extremely difficult because you have to have feet to walk. And so you understand, and I understand from the lesson, is that when you do a thing improperly, when it isn't done right, you may have caused a degree of peace, but it will not be attributed to you. Just as in the case of the supplanter, Jacob, tricking Esau, even though God wanted to have it, he couldn't do it that way. And Jacob caught a lot of trauma after that because you got to do it God's way. You know, brother, I'm thinking of the story where uh, the, uh, the family got punished because of one of the men that disobeyed God, went about his own way of, of taking care of some business. Uh -huh. And in taking care of that business, he jeopardized his family. Okay. And I believe that he died, and his wife was the one that left, but his wife hated him because he had brought on... This had to do with... Uh, wow. yeah. This was in the story of... Um, uh, of uh, early on in, in David's life, I believe it was. Uh -huh. uh, we we're probably going to read about it later in Second Samuel. Okay. But okay. but it is a story of where um, the the um, the wife was upset. No, the daughter-in-law was upset uh -huh. with the father-in-law because the father went about doing this business. Okay. Uh, So-called taking care of some stuff and bringing thinking he's bringing peace to the family but he brought a lot of havoc to the to the I, family and we'll read about it i can't think of yeah. the, i can't we're even gonna, think we're of gonna the wife this in our mind when we come across we yeah this is stories we That's what i was talking about yeah it's a, 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 the father-in-law brought about all this havoc that he thinking he was doing right but it ended up being that he was wrong because uh, i don't think she could find another husband okay. she was she she uh she lost her children. A, a lot of a lot of this went on during this time. But I, I wanted to say that to kind of relate it to the church, how we uh, cleave ourselves to to men. Yes. Because yes. we 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 have to be careful that we're there for our soul. Mm -hmm. You know, the the fighting of our soul, the mm -hmm. the the growing of our soul, and not the elevation of a man or Amen. the pulpit Amen. or the or the whatever. Uh, elders and what have you we have to be careful that what we're doing is for the Lord even if it's something that brings about peace among us all yeah. we still have to be careful because in the process of that you can elevate that's folk. Right. you can put people where they're not supposed to be you that's know right. you, you can uh, have them thinking that they're this but they're really no better than right, right. the brethren as Jesus called us all brethren Amen. You know, and, and we just have to be careful of that. And uh, and I apologize, no scriptures to follow no, this, but, right. but we're, we're going to find, that's that. right, we're <laughs> going to find this scripture that I'm speaking of, or this passage that I'm uh -huh. speaking of about the, the, the father-in-law doing such damage uh -huh. that it caused havoc later on in the lives of his family because they had to all suffer and die because of his, his, um, his decision okay and, and again relating that to the fact that we shouldn't elevate anybody That's because right. we don't know as far as uh what god's plan is is just for us to walk accordingly with with him you know because if we don't want to get in the clicks with others you know because she may not like this sister mm -hmm. and he may not like this brother and she or she or he tells me something and I'm taking the bias part of it and saying well if she don't like her then it must be something wrong so I ain't gonna like her mm -hmm. and you know and then all of a sudden you got this big pool of folk not liking each other mm -hmm. and come along you don't you don't destroy more lives and you think you have you've, you've uh, upset in the sense of um, uh, this brother may have done something wrong or mm -hmm. this sister may have done something wrong but then you've gathered so many with you to make it think you're thinking that you're cleaning it up, but you're really not. So we you just have it. to be. What I'm really saying is, we just have to be careful, careful as Christians, uh, not to elevate anyone, not to tag along with anyone in a sense of they may think is right, but then do your research. You know, re mm -hmm. search it out and make That's sure right. that what is taking place should be taking place, especially when it comes into the Word of God. Amen. Well said, so, so That's so true because this is actually what happens, and I've I've seen brothers. In our fast city, or at least the larger city, Houston, not humble, and uh, they have sat down leaders, uh, and they claim that those leaders were bad leaders, 
but they sat them down for incorrect reason, like their wife died or something like that. And they thought they had done a good deed, but what they should have done is sat the leader down and rebuked them openly and given them a chance to repent of their wicked ways. Then God would have blessed them and they would make it to hell because I'm sure in my heart you can't make it to heaven as these guys hands and feet were cut off doing something like that sister uh thanks sister. Uh, yeah you were talking about um uh you know talking against the leader of God and it just made me think of Leviticus chapter 10 and um it says and Nadab and Abihu the sons of Aaron took e uh, either of them uh the incense and put the fire therein and Put, you know, basically, I'm not gonna read it all, but it's just one through uh, one through three, and it talks about how the uh, sons of uh, Aaron put up strange fire. That's right. But then uh, in verse three, it says, "Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified." And Aaron held his peace. Amen. And sometimes, you know, I don't know what Aaron was thinking in his mind, mm -hmm. but whatever he was thinking he didn't say anything he made sure to stay respectful before the lord and sometimes if you may think you know something you know you have to be careful and be quiet sometimes because you may not know the whole story and it you know amen well said that's another thing that people do amen so hamilton uh they will make a judgment and don't have enough info because they haven't done a thorough investigation. Things have to be investigated. No matter how much the rest the saints are going through, it'll be even worse if we make a rash decision and destroy that which the Lord intended not to be destroyed. And so, therefore, one of the troubles that we find ourselves in is we see the Lord allow a thing and we just automatically think because He allowed it, that was His will. It was his will to allow it. It was not his will that it happened. It was not the will of God that his son would die. Because he would not be angry if that was his will. It would be his perfect will right. that he, I'm applauding, amen, kill the boy. No, it's not like that. It is his will to let it happen because he knows this is the way he's going to end the devil's reign over death. And free all those who want to be free both before, during, and after but he is extremely mad. That's why the skies get dark when they take his son's life. And this is why you have to keep stressing the people and understand God knows everything. When he says he thought about this and changed his mind, he's saying, okay, I'm letting you know, but I already knew what I was going to do. I'm letting you know that I just did not decide this on a whim. I have this in my mind prepared. And this gives us confidence that God... Who wants to serve a God that just makes decisions on a shoestring? Mm. I mean, you know, I, yeah, let's do it. You know, no, nobody can serve like that. No one will trust him. He may change his mind when he shouldn't. So we understand that. Now, let's look at 2 Samuel 5. It says, Then all the tribes of Israel uh, came to David unto Hebron and spake, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. Also in time past, when Saul was king over us, thou wast he that led us out and brought us in Israel. And the Lord said to thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be a captain over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king, to Hebron, and King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel. So henceforth, the title of the lesson, uh, One Nation, so both sides come together, One King. Which is the desire of the law to bring both the Jew and the Gentile together. This is an image of it in Christianity. Verse 4. David was 30 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 40 years. Okay, so David is about 70 years old around that when he dies. Uh, he does not live. He, he, the Bible says David lived many days. He had a great life. A lot of days on earth. Seven years is a lot of days. And you add up, if you're 35, you've been on this earth a lot of days. And so, a lot of people look at that, you know, and recognize, say, you know, well, we got a lot of people live past. Say, yeah, but it, that's a long time to live, man. Seven in my goodness. Yeah, you got people. I saw a guy today, 109. <laughs> that don't mean nothing, no. Still, this guy here, 
is a great king and a great leader and the Lord gives him credit for he has seen many days and so you know great days a lot of days and so but it says here his reign is 40 years going to break it down verse 5 and Hebron he reigned over Judah 7 years and 6 months and in Jerusalem he reigned 30 and 3 years over all Israel and Judah now that's going to be what he's going to do total now remember Listen what it says. Six months in Hebron. Remember I told you that he uh, it says over so forgive me, rain, forgive me, over Judah seven years and six months, forgive me. And then Jerusalem he reigned 33 years over all Israel and Judah. Now why is it like that? Because when you read that, he hasn't got Jerusalem yet. He don't have it yet. See, you would think he doesn't. No, no, no. He's got the Hebron here because they immediately crowned him king. And it say, okay, you over Judah. Okay, but really you over Hebron because really they got some people in Jerusalem that do not like you at all. And we're going to find this out. Verse 6. It says, And the king and all his men went to Jerusalem unto the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land. And listen to that. Okay. Which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come hither. So, so you know, man, you know, you're not coming there, man, you know. That's what I'm telling you, they don't like him. Jebusites are there. And, and he says, uh, Thinking, you know, David cannot come hither. So they thought they say, Man, that's you move the lame and the blind, you're not coming up in here. I'm like, Man, this is David. You lost your mind. You gonna tell me where I can go? I am the king. It's just this spot I need to take. See, this is what's going on. We have to understand, saints. In a church, you can have the saints come together. That will oppose, split, and they can come together under Christ, under great men, or just one man who will rise up and say it will be this way. Through scriptures, the sword will put fear in the hearts of others. But you still may have a pocket that says, well, we didn't like neither one of y'all two groups anyway. We got our own thing. And you got to do something, tell you, because we're not letting it happen. You know, like Dathan, Cornell, Cornel, they said, you know, man, you know, it's, it's like this, man. You take too much on yourself, Moses, you and Aaron. So, let's see what happens. Verse 7, nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. The same as the city of David. He took it. It's the city of David in Jerusalem. Well, how does he do it? Verse 8. And David said on that day, Whosoever get it up to the gutter and smite it to Jebusites and the lame and the blind that are hated of David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. Whereof they said, The blind and the lame shall not come into the house. See, see, David said, You know, look. The Jebusites, since we, we got the city, this little park of the Jebusites, whoever killed him, whoever laid him, straighten him out in the dirt, so I'm going to make him captain. So verse 9, so David dwelt in the fort and called it the city of David, and David built round about for Milo and Enwin. So, you know, David's in the fort, he said, you know, well protected. See, when the Lord destroys your enemies, he just doesn't, you know, put you out in the open. The Lord protects you. A fort, man, you know, it's hard, just hard to get into a fort. And David is secure. The people want him. And they are now hunting the Jebusites. The Lord will turn the righteous heart against the enemy of whoever he has said will be the one who will rule. And that one to rule is Jesus Christ. And also within the church, uh, you have uh, a Jebusite group. It might be the evangelists. It might be a elder, it might be a deacon, it might be a Bible teacher, it might be a sister uh, in the church, it might be one of their wives. And what happens is, is they may not want the head to rule Christ, and therefore the earthly head, the leadership, cannot rule. So they may battle. But the law will turn the hearts of the saints against them with lessons like this to show it. That's why, brother, those things you have to understand, saints. Um, that's a reason why people don't have leadership and order in the church. That's a reason. You always have things to battle. You always have things to fight. We know that. But that's a reason that people don't have order. Because they don't know how to teach order in the church. 
This is a perfect lesson to teach how things can be put together by the Lord. You label each player of the game of life with a name that coincides with this rule. David will always represent the law, but he also will represent a ruler. And his men will represent rulers. And what we have to understand is they actually rise up and set all of Israel in order. And we have to understand if you are blessed by God and you're humble and you study, you will present lesson after lesson after lesson to show why the congregation should be set in order. But if you're not right, it'll not be set in order. That's right. But anybody can rise up and teach the lessons. It doesn't have to be the evangelist. It doesn't even have to be one of the leaders. It can be anybody, any male that will rise up. And it's sisters, or us sisters can encourage them as Deborah encourage Barak to rise up and go and win the battle that the Lord had promised him. So nevertheless he says in uh, verse uh, 9, verse 10, forgive me and David went on and grew great the Lord God of hosts was with him verse 11, high king of Tyre sent messengers to David and cedar trees and carpenters and masons and they built David and how. Now this is why when you see how he's going to be a good friend with David and Hiram is going to also have all the wood perfectly cut when Solomon builds the temple. The Bible says you didn't even hear a hammer. They didn't even because just everything fit. They pushed in the perfect because these guys were the very best at handling wood. And he loves David. And he's going to be happy when David's son, Solomon, becomes king. It's going to be late on in the, uh, you know, um, a few weeks from now. But the idea is this is why you first see his name mentioned. And so, uh, and David perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for his people, Israel's sake. You know, sometimes people will say, you know, that's this nation that's good at uh, artwork. This other nation's good at mountain climbers, other nations good at having animals. And then somebody will rise up and say, that's racist. And you know, but they don't understand, that would make God a racist. It's such foolishness that they say, because they don't understand that God, all throughout the scriptures names, these were the best at handling uh, bronze. These were the best at handling wood. This nation. And he blessed that nation with that gift. And you have these so-called politically, politically correct individuals who really do nothing but stir up animosity and strife among various nations. Some nations are going to always be better than other nations at certain things because God gave them that. And that's how they survive. And it is known in the world that they're the best at this. It has nothing to do with racism. It has to do that they are just the best at it. And God's not going to let that be taken from them. You'll never be as good as they are at that. Sister Hamilton. Brother, when you read uh, verse um, 12, and okay. it, it said, And David perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel, mm -hmm. and that he had exalted his kingdom for his people, Israel's sake. That just made me think, uh, you know, the scriptures say that uh, David had a heart towards God, yes. you know. And, but here, you know, it's and this is not to take away anything, I'm just it just brought to my attention when it said and David perceived and I looked up the word perceived and it just means to know to like to come to know yeah, and so right. like it kind of like saying it dawned on him that yes. God was with him mm -hmm. and it just made me think that like sometimes you may not get it all together right. you know but you have to wait on the Lord like he had a heart for the Lord mm -hmm. so he keep doing he keep you know, keeping God's commands and then, you know, you get it. Like, yes. you get it. You finally know, like, man, God is with me. Like, yes. and you can keep going, you know? That's right. Amen. Well said, sister. Well said because you might think, as the sisters just pointed out by the use of the word, man, this thing, only God could have got these two people together. And then you still got the Jebusites acting a fool too, on top of that. The city that you want to be, and, and it has to be because Jerusalem, the is always been the city. It's always been in God's plan to make it Jerusalem because he knew the other cities were going to act crazy and not act right and he knew it would have to be them. So thank you sisters. So see in verse um, 13, and David took him more concubines and wives out of Jerusalem 
after he was come from Hebron, and they were yet sons and daughters born to David. And these be the names of those that were born unto him in Jerusalem. Shemua, and Shobab, and Nathan, and Solomon. Ibhar also, and Elishua, and Nepheg, and Japhia, and Elishama, and Eliada, and Eliphalet. So he's got a bunch of more children. Uh, there's different women he's had. And this is one of the areas of flaw in David and Solomon with women. Women got David and Solomon in trouble. And once again, they have no one to blame but themselves because we have to understand God is always forewarned to make sure that you listen to me. Everybody should have learned from Adam mm. to watch women. And I'm not knocking women. I mean, watch women. Be careful that this woman is for you. Be careful that you don't accumulate them as they were for one. It was already in Deuteronomy. The king told them to accumulate women. He said, but whatever. And it got them both in trouble. Two of the greatest kings in Israel both got in trouble behind women. If you want to know the truth about it, the women got Saul in trouble. You know how they got Saul in trouble? Because when they sang that song, the Bible said Saul had his eye on David after that. So, what is the story? I remember Sister Carr said this. It is an acknowledgement of the great power that women have and the sisters in God should use it for the glory of God, uplifting of the saints, and not for the destruction of their brothers and sisters and themselves. Because the sisters haven't, haven't had a power. It's so powerful, the Bible says to uh, Solomon, you're not going to be able to even see her ways when she move, make a move on you. It's always talking about something. Guys, we, a lot of guys think that, but you know, they're such big time players. They get their lunch eight all the time. And they want to shoot people and cut them up and kill them up. You understand? You are a fool. The Bible already told you this woman is not right. You got to get one that's right. And you got one that you already knew like uh, poor old Samson. And she just made a move. Like, like sometimes you see sports. Got to make a move and they call it ankle breaking. Got to fall down the people just laugh. He's so embarrassed, he's mad, he want to fight, but God's just too fast for him. And God said, you won't see a way. And you say, well, the Lord, let me see. No, he not, because he's saying, don't go mess with her. Leave her alone, because I'm not showing you nothing, and you sure can't see it. So, we got to understand that. So, that's why I would encourage our sisters to do that, which is right, because they do have an incredible amount of power. Um, let's wrap it up here, uh, 2 Samuel 5 and 17. But when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, and all the Philistines came up to seek David. And David heard of it and went down to the hole. See, now remember, it, you know, it was kind of high. He was kind of high, not kind of went to battle with them, a few battles. And like, now see, now he king of Israel. Now he's really been like a fool with us. So they get ready. We're going to get him. We're going to look for him. Verse 18, the Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to the Philistines? Will thou deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thy hand. David is one of the wisest kings because he asked the Lord first. Got to check with God before you make a move. Even on your enemy. Ask for prayer. Ask for strength. Look for the opening. The Bible says that a man who can take over an area he, yeah, Brother Freya said, uh, shout that scripture with me. He scales the city and he looks for their point of confidence. And that is where he attacks. And so David knows, well, I'm not going to be able to do this on my own. Uh, even though it's the Philistines, I got all the people with me, I still need some help. So I'm going to ask the Lord. Will he be with me? And so the idea is that's information uh, for you and I. Proverbs 21 and 22. If he's wise and scale the city, he looks at it, you know, so where's their confidence? Okay, they have confidence. One time Israel got in battle with some guys and they had confidence in their chariots. So God took them to the valley. Chariots got stuck in the mud, killed them while they was in there. They're like getting shot up while you're in your own car. They're stuck. Engine go out if it was a car. And this is what happened. So David, verse uh, number uh, 20, David came unto Baal P. Arezim, and David smote them there, and 
said, The Lord hath broken forth upon my enemies before me as the breach of waters. Therefore he called the name of that place Baal Perezim. And there they left their images. And David and his men burned. So they left their little false gods. And I say, burnt that up. And so verse 22. And the Philistines came up yet again and spread themselves in the valley of Rephim. When David inquired the Lord, uh-oh, he asked again. Now why did he just get excited and go, let's get him again. They're back. The Lord shall deliver. Because David has wisdom. He says, do we go? But then what the Lord says, thou shalt not go up. But fetch a compass behind them and come upon them over against the mulberry tree. You know, see, I mean, it went out there. You know, you just whooped them. Coming back again, he done got lit up and been in his room. David was slaying all his men. Why? Because the Lord knows they're too strong at this point. I want you to go around the back and get them. Well, they know they're going to whoop you. Now, if you don't do what he says, you get whooped. As Israel saw when they first came to the land. Verse 24 And let it be when thou hearest the sound of a going. In the tops of the mulberry trees, when you hear, hear, when you hear the top of the mulberry trees making noise, now listen, saints, that then thou shalt bestir thyself. For then shall the Lord go out before thee to smite the host of the time. So David and them come behind and say, okay, okay, no, wait, no, wait, no, hold on, y'all. Guys, wait. Wait till you hear the sound at the top of the tree, not at the bottom of the top. That's the Lord's signal because the Lord knows exactly when they're at the most vulnerable point. And he's going to tell you when to attack. We lose battles so many times doing things ourselves. Because we did it before. Moses learned, no, don't hit the rock, Moses. Talk to it this time. And we got to learn from these lessons, saints. We got to learn from these lessons. Now, I have a thing. Final verse. I'm going to deal with verse 12. I mean, forgive me, verse 25. And David did so. It says, uh, as the Lord had commanded him, and smote the Philistines from Geba until thou come to Gazer. Man, what a whooping. Why is this so important? Because, saints, you got to follow the one king that's over everything. In this case, there's a greater king than David. And it is the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh yeah, he's always been there. Because he says, the Lord said unto my Lord. And there's a greater king than Jesus. And that is his father God. And all down they listen. Everybody from God to Jesus listen. Except when you get past Christ. Then you have people hitting me. This is a great man. But why doesn't he go to the Lord and say, Shall I go and take Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? You know why? David know the answer no. David already know the answer no. That's why he doesn't pray. He doesn't ask no question. It's another man's wife. He had no problem asking for his wife from Petul because he said, That's, that's my woman, McCall. Well, that's mine. You want peace? Give me my wife back. You know? And she married another man. I don't want to hear that. That's my wife. I had that woman before I even left dealing with the Philistine. But he knows you right. Man, that's his wife. And he's one of David's mighty men. This is one of David's many low points in his life. And saints, you got to stop and ask yourself, why don't we go ask God? Shall I go up and steal that car down the street, Lord? But thy hand be with me. As I say so, you got baptized. Shall I go and fool around with that girl next door? Because her husband, he beats her. He's not nice. No. No, ask the Lord that. Because you already know the answer is no. Shall I take over the church and be its king and then Jesus can serve me? No. No, not I appreciate you. No, I was thinking about Moses with the rod. Uh, Moses, at a certain point, God was telling him, like, you have the rod. Do mm -hmm. what you're supposed to do. Because yeah. at a certain point, like, you, you know, you ask God, but then, too, you have to know what God has said. Because, yeah. yeah. Amen. Well said, sister. Amen. And, you know, this is the problem with men. You know, you know, it's amazing how people can just... Sometimes we just come up with some stuff and God help us. We have to stand down. Let God be God. All we got to do is be servants. Amen. So if you're here, you're not a member of church Christ, or you listen to the message. Recognize the church has to be put together by God. 
just as Israel has to be put together by God. And as he puts it together, he selects Jesus Christ as his head, as his king. And he selected David as he put together Israel as his king. And that can be only one king. It's a throne. Not thrones. It's not like Game of Thrones, but there's one throne. And so we have to understand that. So what do you do? You acknowledge Jesus died, buried, the third day rose again. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. If you accept that in your heart, the Lord will purge your heart of all the sins and expunge you of all guilt. See, one of the things is just thinking you say just something. To know you can read about your salvation. And the Bible is full of confidence. You know, if you sleep on a pillow and you should pass away. That God will be with you. And so therefore when Jesus speaks said he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Believe what? That he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That he died, buried on the third day, lives again and forevermore. And a person has to accept in their heart that he says he that believes not shall be down. When Peter preaches Acts 2 and verse 35 he discusses with them all the glory of Jesus Christ in verse 36 he lets know he is both Lord and Christ. He wraps up his speech and in verse 37 they ask men and brethren share with you. He says, repent and be baptized. If they knew what to do, they didn't want to, do we need to get baptized? They didn't have any idea. And those that have been baptized by John, I mean, they would have never thought about being baptized again, but they have to according to Acts 19, 1 through 5. And so therefore, he says, repent and be baptized, everyone, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for the promise unto you, and unto your children, unto all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words, he testify and encourage them, saying, save yourself. From this unto all that is perverted generation. Then they that glad to his word were about to the same day, and about three thousand souls were added unto them. These are facts. These are things that were prophesied, and they will last forever. We believe that and embrace in our heart. Then it explains why the eunuch being so excited, you would think Philip would just baptize. Look, here's water in the desert. Man, what more do we need? But he says, what hinders me? If you believe with all your heart, you may. He says, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And a child stops and he's baptized. And then a rejoicing begins. Paul explains in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit, which is the Holy Spirit, not by Philip's spirit. By one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether Jew or Gentile, body or free. And have all been made to drink into one spirit. We believe that Peter explains 1 Peter 3 21, the life figure went to even baptism. Does also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of flesh, but it's the answer of a good conscience to our God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That means that's why it gets its authority. That's what the metaphor of going into the water represents and shows. And where is he? Who is in heaven at the right hand of God, angel authority and power subject unto him. If you believe that, then the Lord shall surely rescue you if you complete that in baptism. And then the message is to be faithful to us and to those that will be baptized. Revelation 2.10 He says, Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. He says, Clearly, shall have tribulation ten days to be thou faithful unto death and you will have everlasting life. You know, he picks a bad example to show even those who are imprisoned by this beast, Satan. All they need to do is hold on to the faith of him and he will rescue. We believe that. We baptize now. If you listen to the message, please call the number. There will be someone to help you no matter where you live. And if you're here though, you're a member of the church, you've gotten off track. It's not too late. Don't try to fight that sin yourself. Don't try to defeat that demon alone. He will whoop you every time like a child. You've got to have the help of the saints, the Calvary, who are those who pray. Need prayer. Don't hesitate. Come now and together we stand and sing heaven's invitation. Oh, and tender the Jesus is calling for you and for me. See on the portals he's waiting.